So, Todd is gone. I can't find him anywhere. I've tried everything. I've looked under all the furniture. I've looked in every place I can last remember seeing him in. I've called his name. I, I don't know what to do now. So, I'm just going to continue on with the only show on the internet. First, I want to talk about something that Todd would never let me talk about again. Dark Souls. Dark Souls 1 is my favorite Dark Souls game, and easily ranks on my top 5 favorite games of all time. Dark Souls 3 came behind Dark Souls 1 in terms of ranking, and Dark Souls 2 follows behind it, and it is safe to say Dark Souls is my favorite fantasy series of all time. Of all the Souls games, the one I am the most conflicted about is Dark Souls 3. Before writing this, I had very clear critical thoughts and opinions on all of the Souls games except for this one. However, while working on a different version of this video, I came to understand where this game goes wrong in my opinion, and falls short, not just of other Dark Souls games, but as a standalone piece of media. Dark Souls 3 is the final game to bear the Dark Souls name, and not only that, Dark Souls 3 has one of the best foundations of any video game. But, I wouldn't be talking about Dark Souls 3 like I am in this intro paragraph if there wasn't a massive but after that. Mostly because it wouldn't be very interesting. Also, I can move now if you hadn't noticed. The biggest overarching problem with Dark Souls 3 is that it has so many unique ideas, but they never really go anywhere. This is kind of a strange thing to say about a Dark Souls game, as Souls games aren't really known for being the most upfront games with what's actually happening, but the Souls series almost always finds a way to tie it together, whether it be through mechanics, subtle world building, or item descriptions that you have to go out of your way to look at. However, Dark Souls 3 is an outlier when it comes to this, because it never really feels like anything connects together in much of a meaningful way, even if we're judging the metric of how meaningful something is by using a game like Far Cry as a comparison. This is first evidenced in going to Firelink Shrine and activating the bonfire. Unfortunately, the world is no longer really connected together, and Firelink Shrine is completely separate from the rest of the world. This is kind of a misleading statement, because all the levels do lead into each other, but they are often from forks in a linear road, and functionally, they may as well be completely separate, with graphical cues and clues to where you are in the world compared to the other levels, like Demon Souls. I think this is kind of unfortunate, because this is part of what made Dark Souls 1, specifically the first half, so memorable, and every game since has strayed further and further from this design. One way to make this more bearable is to introduce shortcuts that loop back on a central bonfire for the level, that make progressing back to where you were after a death shorter. Cathedral of the Deep is a perfect example of this working nearly flawlessly. Making your way from Crystal Sage to the central bonfire for the cathedral, going back out and around, exploring and finding doors that lead back to the bonfire is done so well, which makes it extremely unfortunate that only like five other levels in the entire game, including the DLC, effectively execute this. Instead, Dark Souls 3 feeds the player through linear hallways, with the only branching paths being for item finding and tiny little rooms jutting off to the side of the completely straight levels. Looking back at Dark Souls 1, Dark Root Basin, this tiny, insignificant, almost glorified staircase leads to and from two separate areas, three if you count the teleport to the DLC, and each of those areas connects to another area, at the very least. Keep doing that for all the areas in the game, and you have a world, while a little weird spatially, that not only feels much more significant than Dark Souls 3, but also gives the player a better sense of direction than just going in a virtually straight line. 
atmosphere in the levels is also sorely lacking in this game. Green lighting is often used in cinematography as a tell that something isn't right, is unnatural, or as a color to make you uneasy, as green lighting isn't something that really occurs naturally. Dark Souls uses greens and browns paired with gray skies very effectively in creating a very oppressive environment. Dark Souls 2 makes the player travel down into the darkness and then literally rise up to the beaming sun, usually accompanied by a castle and some god rays. Dark Souls 3 doesn't really have any of this grandiose release, nor any of the dingy atmosphere. There isn't really any distinction of its own visual style compared to how distinct every single one of the other Souls games are, especially with how much is retreaded environmentally from the previous games, particularly in the base game. Now, I understand the world of Dark Souls 3 has been going on for so long that it takes place both before and after Dark Souls 1 and maybe 2, and as a result, everything has kind of meshed together. I think this is a really interesting premise and can make for a lot of really cool environments. The final level before the Lord of Cinder in the Dreg Heap proves this. However, the final level and the Dreg Heap are visually distinct enough that they feel like new environments, where the rest of the game just feels like more hollow and less interesting versions of the levels that came before them. Nowhere is this more apparent than in Anne Orlando. Anne Orlando is a completely reused area that is almost the exact same as it was in Dark Souls 1, except it's much smaller and has much less content. Bringing back in Orlando is actually, I think, a really good idea, as it is the most recognizable place from the original game because of how much of a departure it is. Being taken up by the weird albino gargoyle things and being treated to this massive castle in a glowing golden sky is an incredible moment from the original game, and has the potential to be spun on its head to communicate the clashing of worlds supposedly going on in Dark Souls 3. You wouldn't even need a big cutscene for it just a very well-placed elevators in the form of one of the spinning towers. The enclosure itself could be half destroyed, and as the tower rotates up, you could slowly see a strange and malformed amalgamation of Ian Orlando and Irithyll of the Boreal Valley combined into one larger area just renamed Ian Orlando. This is only one of the possibilities of not only making An Orlando and Irithel much more interesting level than it already is, but effectively using An Orlando as a storytelling device. This doesn't happen, however, almost anywhere in the game aside from like two or three bosses. Another place where this happens is in Farron Keep, a massive poison swamp that is inferred to just fall away at some point and create Blight Town. However, there is very little indication of how Farron Keep would even fall away in the first place, nor are there any details referencing Blight Town aside from being a big poison swamp with some stone architecture and some pyromancy. Firelink Shrine is another great missed opportunity to tell more from the strange converging of worlds. Throw in some references to Dark Souls 2, to the decaying church where you put the Lord Vessel. I mean, Dark Souls 2 is incredibly disconnected from Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 3 by proxy, and even it has a reference to the Lord Vessel. It is extremely disappointing that the concept of clashing worlds and times is so severely underutilized, especially after seeing and playing the Ring City DLC, which takes place in the city that Gwen had built for the furtive pygmy race. Even gameplay-wise, there isn't much to say about the level design, which honestly might be a good thing, especially compared to some of the more painful areas in Dark Souls 1 and 2, but it causes the game to lack a distinct identity. You can make levels have identity without flattening out their features while still making them play well, something the first areas of the game do extremely well. Gameplay in this game is, on paper, the absolute best in the entire series. The jump from Dark Souls 1 and 2 to Dark Souls 3 is less a diversion in the series than Dark Souls 2 is compared to Dark Souls 1 because of how well Dark Souls 3 combines both. Dark Souls 3 pretty much takes Dark Souls 1's combat and sounds down the edges instead of trying to supersede it like Dark Souls 2 did, most notably adding a multi-directional role when locked on instead of the four-way role Dark Souls 1 had, which, to its credit, is something Dark Souls 2 also did. Attack animations no longer feel as dragged out compared to Dark Souls 2 and feel much more fitting for the individual weapons and what they visually look like. This improvement also comes with a change in the magic system and the introduction of weapon arts. Spells no longer have a set use counter, and instead, the amount of spells you can cast is determined by a more traditional mana bar called focus points, which can be raised by increasing attunement. I think this is a great change for the series, but it kind of stretches some stats thin for more magic-oriented characters. 
Along with this comes the aforementioned weapon arts, a big special move mostly unique to each weapon that consumes focus points. I honestly have little to say on the system, as it's a really neat addition for things like PvP and some of the arts are sick as fuck, but they serve very little purpose outside of niche cases and PvE or offline play and kind of just fade into, oh yeah, that move. However, this hasn't stopped me from experimenting with a lot of different weapons and playthroughs, even if I never actually finished them. Dark Souls 3 is really good at making weapons at least look interesting enough, even if they're just generic sword or bigger sword, mostly due to how much you can now do with them with the new infusion system. There are multiple new infusions that mostly either serve to be an intermediary for people earlier in the game but have something like a dark build in mind, or now serve to boost strength and dex stat scaling for everybody who just plays pure melee. Unfortunately, this hasn't solved the problem with dexterity weapons consistently outclassing strength weapons, something that FromSoft can't seem to even come close to getting right. This isn't to say that strength weapons are unusable, far from it, but there's a big difference between usability and practicality. Dex weapons are much faster and have much lower weight than strength weapons, which makes sense. However, dex weapons can be pushed into having much more damage compared to previous games in the series thanks to the Sharp Gem. Paired with the already very high dex scaling of other dex weapons, the Sharp Infusion can now make weapons do the same amount of damage of strength weapons in two hits for less damage than heavy weapons cost you for one swing, all the while increasing mobility options. This loss for strength weapons was made even worse by the loss of real dual wielding from Dark Souls 2. It's baffling to me that Dark Souls 3 doesn't use Dark Souls 2's dual wielding system, as there is so little reason to remove it. You can still have a weapon in your left hand in Dark Souls 3, but you're better off just using a shield or foregoing it completely again, unless you're using a weapon that provides a buff on equip, or has a parry. The only logical reason I can think of to not include this system is to accommodate for the Twin Blades. Except, there are only 14 weapons that can be considered twin blades or even twin weapons out of 189 weapons. And, here's the real kicker, you can still one-hand twin blades with a shield. And, just to rub salt in the wound, you can use a pair of twin blades in your right and another twin weapon in your left. Now, there is no reason to use a weapon in your offhand that either can't parry or doesn't provide you with a direct buff. This limits the amount of weapons viable to offhand to around 25 in the best case scenario, as some weapons that can do this are just better off not being in your left hand. And now for the most unfortunate part of this game, the bosses. Usually, bad bosses in the Soul series are isolated incidents that come from lack in development time, leading to bosses being rushed, like the Bed of Chaos. Unfortunately, unless all of the bosses were completely rushed, this does not seem to be the case in Dark Souls 3, as all of the issues the bosses have are consistent, not only with fellow bosses, but with all enemies in the game. This is very apparent in what is supposed to be the second boss fight in the game, Vort. Vort's attacks and all enemies just feel too fast. Now I guess some people really like this, which is apparent from the success of Bloodborne, but I do not, and I think it leads to a lot of problems. Circling back, Vort isn't a bad boss by any means, and really only has a couple of issues that mess with this fight. First, this one move. This attack is realistically unreactable, and if you say otherwise, I can comfortably say that you're just wrong. Most bosses have an attack like this that is so fast it's easier to just get hit and sacrifice healing instead of thinking about it too much. And this attack for Vort is pretty reactable compared to some of the other bosses' moves in the game. Secondly, Vort is often considered to be the real tutorial boss to the game, as Yudux Gundir takes a more traditional approach to Dark Souls boss design and can pretty easily be beaten if you're at least an adept player. However, Vort often thrashes around and moves too much to be super readable for new players without even more of an adjustment from other games than Gundir provides. Unfortunately, most of the other bosses have issues like this, and the bosses that don't are very notable for being pretty stellar bosses not only in Dark Souls 3, but in the Souls series in general. Now, you'll notice I don't talk about the DLC very much, because I don't really have many issues with it, nor do I really have anything to praise. I have footage for it, I just can't find much of substance to say about it. There are good pieces of content that make improvements to Dark Souls 3, but it isn't game-changing content, just a bit more of the same, but better, which is really unfortunate, especially for how much they're charging for it. 
Now, the three biggest issues with Dark Souls 3's bosses are interesting concept but poor execution, of which bosses that pretty much solely have this issue can be found on this list on your screen right now because they are not interesting to talk about at all. Design that makes the bosses more unfair to the player. AI that never stops for the player's sake. 75% of the time, bosses have at least two of these issues present, and it's only when you really get lucky that you either have one or none of these issues. These bosses are also scattered throughout the entire game, so there's never really a great part of the game that lasts for a significant amount of time. The first boss that you'll encounter that has these issues is Crystal Sage. Crystal Sage makes you deal with ranged attacks while moving close to the Sage to attack them. This is a fine setup and is used pretty well in other bosses in this same game. However, Crystal Sage is not one of these bosses. The first phase of this boss is pretty boring and easy once you figure out how to avoid all of their attacks or just run straight at them from the fog wall. Where this boss gets problematic is in the second phase. Once pushed to around half health, the Crystal Sage will duplicate into four sages, three of them being illusory clones that will die in one hit. The player is challenged with dealing with the fake clones who have blue magic while trying to hit the real sage who has purple magic to kill the boss. What makes this unfair is that all of the sages attack independently of each other, making it so that one mistake, that any other boss wouldn't be the end of the world, will now instantly kill you because all of the sages independently decided to attack at the perfect interval for you to get stunlocked to death. This is also almost guaranteed to kill you at the level you should be fighting the Crystal Sage at. While hitting the apparitions to get rid of them is, you know, the very clearly intended way to beat this boss, getting to the point where you can hit the real sage is painful, tedious, and relies too much on getting lucky that each AI's decision doesn't intersect to screw the player over. And then, after hitting the real sage a couple of times, you have to do it all over again. This boss is doubly unfortunate because there is another boss in this game that has the same ranged attack gimmick that does it very well, Aldrich. Aldrich is a giant slug thing that teleports to different corners of the arena where you have to make your way over to him while avoiding his ranged attacks. However, you are never stuck in a position where you can't react to an attack or not be able to see an attack, because while this boss gets harder in the second phase, it doesn't challenge the player's anger management ability, and instead challenges the player's ability to deal with variations of attacks they've just had to learn in the first phase. These design choices that don't really make sense outside of making sure the player has as little of a fighting chance as possible is a common theme. However, Crystal Sage is an outlier in how it screws the player over. The more common way bosses do this is found in the Abyss Watchers. I have a much better opinion of the Abyss Watchers now than I did when I first played this game, coming from a better understanding of fights with multiple enemies, but also a newfound appreciation for how well designed the first phase of this boss is. During the Abyss Watchers fight, a maximum of three Abyss Watchers spawn, and the player has to kill the Abyss Watcher that has the boss health bar to move on. The main gimmick to deal with them is that they can attack each other, giving the player the opportunity to separate the boss with the main health bar from the rest and fight him 1v1 for a bit, or attack the main abyss watcher while they're distracted and fighting each other. The only two issues with this phase of the boss fight is that the abyss watchers will only attack each other if there are three of them spawn. If there are two, they will both attack you. This kind of sucks, but this problem is likely due to and is compounded by the fact that they can't attack each other unless they are locked onto each other. Having this kind of accidental friendly fire would be incredible for this boss and would probably make this boss more bearable for new players. While the first phase of this boss is pretty much the best gank fight in the entire series, fight me, the second phase of this boss sucks. In the second phase of the boss, a single abyss watcher gets powered up and becomes fiery, I get it, haha, <laughs> but this is where the boss get bad. Obviously, you have to close in in order to hit the boss if you're not a magic user. But this Abyss Watcher has trails of fire on his attacks and other fire attacks that force the player back away from him. This wouldn't be much of an issue if Dark Souls 3 let player capitalize on the short amount of time after a boss's attack, like in Dark Souls 1, or even Dark Souls 2, which did this better than any other game. But, Dark Souls 3 doesn't do this for most bosses. Instead, bosses often can just choose to follow up an attack or combo with another one anytime they happen to feel like it, punishing the player for trying to do something like attack or use an Estus after identifying the boss should have stopped attacking. Now, to heal for example, you could just back away for spacing, but if a boss can just choose to keep doing combos that almost always move the boss horizontally, you'll just get stuck back at square one until you get lucky enough for the boss to decide not to do that. 
This is the biggest problem with the game, and is present in almost every single boss after Abyss Watchers, which is made worse in this through the stupid fire trails that stay active as a source of damage for the player for way too long and can still hit you after rolling through an attack, which almost forces the player to mash the roll button after an attack, because they had the audacity to think they could circumvent the Abyss Watcher spacing you out by getting up and personal. A hop, skip, and a jump from the Abyss Watchers is Pontiff Sullivan, the test to see if players are ready to face the second half in this game. Pontiff is a mostly good boss that is once again weighed down by Dark Souls 3's special way of doing things. Once again, Pontiff can just decide to start another combo after finishing another. Some moves are borderline unreactable, like this dash that kinda just happens. Not only is the windup not quick enough, the Pontiff moves so fast that the camera can't keep up with him and unlocks from him if he misses. It's probably a good thing that this move does not track the player properly. In his second phase, Pontiff gains a stand, which does Pontiff's attacks before Pontiff does. This sounds like an amazing concept, using what the Phantom does as a guide to dodge attacks and increase in complexity. I mean, there's so much you could do with this. I mean, the Phantom probably shouldn't do as much damage, but it does enough that you want to try and roll through the attacks even though they don't knock you down, so that when the real Pontiff comes over to the real attack, simultaneously there's a deeper understanding of a crazy attack, but there's also more pressure on the player to roll through them with the chunk of damage the Phantom could have done, right? So it, it works like that, right? Haha. <laughs> no. Nothing changes between the Phantom's attacks and the Pontiff's attacks, and if it does, it is so nominal that I can't notice it. There is so little reason for the Phantom to be there if the attacks do the same thing as the Pontiffs, because you may as well have two Pontiffs that have the same health bar. Except, the Phantom and the Pontiff don't share the same health bar, making the Phantom's only purpose to be a glorified pothole for the player to avoid and get rid of. It's yet another pointless addition that only serves to inconvenience the player rather than to test their skill level. Dancer of the Boreal Valley is a much better gatekeeper, as her moveset is strange and unorthodox, mostly due to the timing of her moves. And while she has some moves that are so inconsistent on when she does them it screws over the player, her overarching design actually makes sense and has purpose. The boss's purpose is also something this game really struggles with, especially later. While they are my two favorite bosses in the game, Dragon Slayer Armor and Champion Gundyr have very little purpose to really be in the game. Dragon Slayer Armor seems to be put at the end of Lothar Castle just because there has to be a boss at the end of every area in the game, otherwise it's not a Dark Souls game. Champion Gundyr serves so little purpose that I can't come up with any reason that he should or shouldn't be in the game other than to be a gatekeeper to an area that, um... Uh... Anyways, after killing Dragon Slayer armor and getting through the Grand Archives, you fight the Twin Princes. Twin Princes is a boss that kind of just sucks, not because it's awful, but because it's just really lame. The first phase of this boss is extremely generic on its own, but paired with the teleport move, some moves just become unreactable guesswork, as some attacks that come after the teleport you have to dodge almost immediately, but some attacks will hit you if you dodge immediately. These attacks are barely telegraphed in any distinct way, which means you have to guess, which doesn't work if some attacks punish you for guessing. Also, this shit has happened to me multiple times. The second phase just doesn't seem to work very well. One twin will piggyback on the other and you have to kill the twin on the back to end the fight because he'll just revive the big one if you do kill the big one. I feel like if this was the entire boss and they found a way to have a second phase that really shakes the dynamic of the boss up but only just enough to throw the player off, like Lorian standing up and doing something crazy with that, would make this an incredible second to last boss fight. But unfortunately, the first phase of this boss is just kind of tiring and annoying to play, which sucks because this boss could be one of the most exciting and engaging bosses in the game. I think this boss is even more underwhelming when you think of it as part of the grand finale, and as a companion to the final boss of this game, the Soul of Cinder. The Soul of Cinder is heavily, and I mean heavily, in bold and italicized font implied to be the amalgamation of all the people who linked the fire and kept the flame alive this long, including the final boss of Dark Souls 1, Gwen, and your own character from Dark Souls 1 if you chose to link the fire. This boss is in the best looking arena of any of the Souls games, swaps through every single notable weapon and attack type in the series, and then dons Gwen's moveset as Gwen's theme from Dark Souls 1 meshes into the soundtrack with that piano.
so it really sucks to say that this boss fight is pretty mediocre and suffers from all of the same issues almost every single boss up to this point has suffered from, which sucks because this could have been the greatest duel the series has ever seen, and yet falls so, so far short of the final boss from Dark Souls 1, despite having the setup to far surpass it. Here, at the end of the video, there was supposed to be an entire section that detailed the Nameless King's issues and why I think he's the culmination of all the problems this game has. You can now see the entire section of that script going by on screen now. Wee! I have been working on this video on and off very sporadically for around six months now. In that time, I've had, obviously, a lot of time to let Dark Souls 3 sit with me. While I've criticized this game pretty extensively throughout this video, I don't think I really got across how bizarre this game really is, at least in my view. So many choices surrounding this game don't critically make sense to me, and upon closer examination, half of those choices are still a mystery. Like, why isn't there proper Dark Souls 2 dual wielding in the game? Development between Dark Souls 2 and Dark Souls 3 didn't intersect in any way, because Bloodborne was the game being made mostly alongside Dark Souls 2, so it was either an arbitrary decision to cut it, or they just didn't consider it. But I get hung up on the latter option. Too much of the Soul series seems and feels so intentionally put there, and while I'm willing to accept that real people made the Souls games and maybe those people just didn't think of it, for a mechanic as widely used and I'm pretty sure liked as dual wielding in that game, I find it highly improbable that that's the case. This goes for most other things I've criticized in this game and throughout this video, but maybe these Bizarre choices are kind of the point of Dark Souls 3. Demon Souls, Dark Souls 1, Dark Souls 2, they're all fundamentally built on the same basic foundation, but when it comes to content and how actually playing the game feels, they are all so unique from one another. And Dark Souls 3 is unique too, just in a different way. Dark Souls 3, rather than reinventing the wheel like Dark Souls did to Demon Souls and Dark Souls 2 did to Dark Souls, instead try to make itself unique by calling upon all the different aspects of Dark Souls' past. But this results in an experience that feels almost completely unoriginal, derivative, and not super captivating. But then again, the unoriginality is the point, no? There is a reason your character is basically made of ash in the story, why all of the Lord's Ascenders look like they're smoldering in their boss fights. One of the main mechanics in the game is restoring your ember. While these elements read okay on a wiki, if you're solely playing the game, it never becomes clear how these elements are being used, because there isn't an end cap to the story. This is, unless you pay $15 for an ending to the series that actually makes sense. Dark Souls 3 is the last game to carry the Dark Souls name, and, to its credit, it definitely feels like it. For a game that is almost begging to be compared to its predecessors, I think in order to really appreciate what it does, you just have to take it for what it is. Does it still have, let's say, some game-defining flaws? Yes, absolutely. But taken at face value, it's incredibly impressive to have a final game in a series as high-profiled and revered as Dark Souls, and have that final game be aware of its own status. And I think that's what I missed about this game through most of my criticisms in this video. This game is almost even more unabashedly what it is compared to Dark Souls, which had to somehow keep everything that people thought made Demon Souls great while cutting off all the excess. Or Dark Souls 2, which had to follow up and live up to the original Dark Souls. Through reading interviews both before and after Dark Souls 3 released, it seems to me everyone who worked on it had the understanding that Dark Souls 3 would be the last Dark Souls game, and was pretty accepting of that fact. To me, Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2 are games that I not only really enjoy playing, despite their own issues, but are games that mean something to me personally. But Dark Souls 3 is a game that isn't disconnected, or a game that I think is outright bad, like Bloodborne, for example. So that puts Dark Souls 3 in a weird place for me, because it's far from bad, but there is so much to criticize that previous games did so much better. But, I don't know, I'm kinda weird too, so maybe Dark Souls 3 and I have some common ground.